God bless you. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel 47. And I want to share with you a little bit about the river of God this morning. Ezekiel chapter 47. While you're finding your way there, just want to give thanks to the Lord. Uh, we were able on Friday morning to pour the sanctuary slab, the main level of our new building. And the Lord was really, really good to us. He gave us exactly the window of weather that we needed to pour that slab. Uh, if you remember, yeah, it's... If you remember at the beginning of last week, it was brutally cold and uh, the weather warmed up. It, it was just what it needed to be this weekend um, so that we could pour that slab. It's under a, under a cozy blanket for the weekend, so you can't quite see it. If you look out the window, um, they'll uncover it. But uh, our construction manager, Tim, kind of felt like if we didn't get it poured on Friday, it might be March before we could get it poured. And uh, we need the slab in place so we can continue putting up the steel. It had to be in place. And so uh, the Lord was just really good. So thank you for your prayers. And thank you for your gifts towards phase two. All right, look with me in Ezekiel chapter 47. Uh, beginning again, reading in verse one, Ezekiel is getting an angel guided tour of the temple. So let's uh, listen to the conclusion of his tour. Ezekiel 47, verse 1, the man, who is an angel, brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faces east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling, I want you to notice that word, from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your people you love so much and for your powerful word. Father, maybe we encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen? If you were with us on New Year's Eve, I shared a word from the Lord that I want to build on today. If you weren't able to join us, I encourage you, go to our website, listen to the audio file that's there, or you can go to our YouTube channel, you can watch the video. But the word that the Lord has given me for this new year is get ready to experience the river of God in 2016. I shared on New Year's Eve three prophetic promises from Psalm 46. Looking at Ezekiel 47, I have four more prophetic promises to share with you because they're prophetic because Ezekiel 47 is a, a prophetic chapter. It speaks to our day, and I'm sharing them with you now under the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Four more prophetic promises. We're only going to get to one this morning, and this is it. In 2016, we are going to be overwhelmed by the rising presence of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that in the midst of this troubled world, God has a city. If you're wondering where is this city, you're standing in it. The city is not a where, it's a who. The city is you. Jesus told us that himself. The city is God's people wherever we're gathered. And in the midst of God's city, God's people, there is a river. The river is not a what, but it's a who too. The river is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Jesus told us about that river. He said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water shall flow out from him. By this he meant the Holy Spirit. 
I want you to notice a couple of things about God's river with me this morning. First of all, I want you to notice the source of God's river. God's river originates from God's throne. It originates from his dwelling place, from God's own presence. Ezekiel saw water running out from the threshold of the temple sanctuary, the building where the Holy of Holies was located. Inside the Holy of Holies, God sat enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant between the wings of the cherubim. Beloved, the river of God originates with Yahweh. It originates with the God who cut covenant with Abraham, the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. The river of God originates with the God of the Jewish people who once dwelt in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and who revealed himself in past times through the Jewish prophets. Jesus told a thirsty woman who was following a false religion, salvation comes from the Jewish people through the Jewish Messiah. The river of God is God's own extension of himself in our direction. You see, we can't go into the most holy place. We can't travel right now to the highest heaven where God dwells because we are yet earthbound. So in his mercy and in his grace, God extends his own presence outward to us. Listen, the river of God is everything that God is extended outward from his exalted dwelling place down to our messed up dwelling place. How awesome is that? The, the river of God is a picture that God has reached out from heaven and has extended himself to all of us. Paul said God is hoping that men will reach out and find him because he is not far from any one of us. God's river originates from God's throne. And it comes to us by way of the person of Jesus exclusively. From the threshold of the temple sanctuary, Ezekiel saw that water flowing in a specific direction. It went past the huge altar of sacrifice that was in the center of the temple courtyard. You know, the altar of sacrifice is a picture of Jesus. Jesus says that the New Testament, in the New Testament, that, that he was the altar and he was the sacrifice on the altar, the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was the high priest who made the once and for all offering and he was the eternal offering itself. And God's river that travels past that altar, that travels past the cross, it carries to us the forgiveness of sins that was purchased on the cross. It carries to us God's pardon. It carries to us God's acceptance. It carries peace with God in our direction. Jesus said that this river of God, it comes through him and him alone, through faith in him, through faith in his cross. He told that thirsty woman at the well, the water that I give people will become inside of them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In the temple, he said, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within him. God's river, it originates from his throne, it comes to us by way of the person of Jesus exclusively and it extends to us the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel saw that water flowing to the south side of the altar of sacrifice. On the south side of the altar was located the huge bronze wash basin that the priests used to purify themselves before going on duty. They would come before ministering at the altar and ministering inside the temple sanctuary. They would come to that huge wash basin and they would wash their faces and their hands and their feet. In Solomon's temple, it was massive. It was 15 feet in diameter. It was the size of a, a small round above 
above-ground pool. It was called the Bronze Sea. And the New Testament says that this bronze wash basin is a picture to us of the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. So this is the source of God's river. It originates from his throne. It's God's own extension of himself to us. Everything that God is, he has put in that river and he has pushed it out to us. The water travels past the altar. It comes to us by way of the person of Jesus and his cross. And it travels past the brass sea. It brings to us the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now, along with the source of the river, I want you to notice with me this morning the supernatural rise of God's river. An angel guides Ezekiel out of the north gate of the temple, and they travel around the outside and go back to the front of the east gate. The east gate was sealed shut. But from under that gate, Ezekiel sees a trickle of water running out. The Hebrew word in verse 2 of chapter 47 is literally a gurgle of water. It actually imitates the sound of a little bit of water being poured out of a bottle. Guk, guk, guk. So it literally says, I saw a guk, guk, guk of water coming out of the east gate. So listen, here's where we find out that from the temple sanctuary, past the altar, past the brass wash basin, all the way to the east gate, the river of God isn't a river at all. It's just a little g -g 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 -g. it's just a little trickle, just a little gurgle of water. But look what happened. The angel and Ezekiel, they walk through that gurgle about 1,700 feet. And when they stop, the gurgle has risen to ankle deep. Now, additional water hasn't come from anywhere else. It wasn't raining torrents of rain like it was when you left your house this morning to come to church. There isn't another stream flowing into that gurgle to add water to it. No water has come from anywhere else, and yet the river is rising. They wait another 1,700 feet and stop. And now that gurgle has grown to a stream that's knee-deep. They wait another 1,700 feet, and now it's a river that's waist-deep. They wait another 1,700 feet, and now the gurgle is a rushing, gushing river that is over Ezekiel's head. And the angel stops, and he says, Ezekiel, now this is what I want you to see. I want you to see that this river has risen supernaturally. I want you to see that this river has risen contrary to all the laws of nature. I want you to see that this river of God has risen and it is God's own doing. Now listen, if I were to take this bottle of water and I were to pour it out on the top step of this altar, what would happen? It would just run in every direction and it would just quickly dissipate, wouldn't it? It certainly wouldn't form a stream going down the center aisle of the sanctuary. And it certainly wouldn't get deeper from the altar to the back door. And if we traveled a mile and a quarter down Bedford Road straight ahead of me, it certainly wouldn't be a river that's over your head by the time you get there. But that's precisely what happened in Ezekiel's vision. And the angel says, now look at that. So let's look at it, shall we? The supernatural rise of God's river is a picture of our whole salvation experience and especially of our experience in the Holy Spirit. The rising river means, for one thing, that our salvation in Christ is thoroughly God's doing and not our own doing. Beloved, listen to me and hear me because in the day and age in which we live, it is so important that you understand this truth and you embrace it. Our salvation is not some kind of effort that we make at self-improvement. Our salvation is not some kind of resolution that we've made to be a better person or a more spiritual person or a more benevolent person. It's not our own self-determined pursuit 
to become more centered or to connect with some cosmic force out there. How many times have you heard somebody say, I worship God my own way? Psh, as if God has given anyone that prerogative. Do you know how arrogant that is? It is. Our salvation originates with God. It's his doing. It comes from him. It's his initiative delivered to us by the way that he has determined. Our salvation comes to us by way of the person of Jesus Christ, specifically by way of his cross. And it is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, it is the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit. The wind blows. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know where it's going. But oh man, do you see its effect? The rising river also means that our salvation experience and our experience with the Holy Spirit is an always growing experience. You know, our salvation, it begins with just a little trickle from God's sanctuary. It begins with just a little ripple of conviction inside of us. Just a little stirring in our spirit. It begins with just a little tiny flicker of faith. Just a little bubble of belief. And pretty soon faith starts to flow through us. And it starts to grow and grow. Our salvation, it begins with one tiny moment of divine encounter. For some people it happens at a church service like this one. For me, it happened one night on my bed when I was eight years old. For others, I know it happened at a kitchen table when a believer asked, would you like to pray? I went to school with a friend who had his moment in the hull of a Coast Guard cutter during a storm at sea. Wherever and whenever your moment happens from that one small moment, our salvation grows until it overtakes all of our life. Suddenly, we find our interests changing. We find ourselves interested in the Bible. We want to know what it says. We find ourselves interested in church. We get up on a miserable January morning when it's pouring rain and you want to, you know, I have eaves on my house and, and the sound of the rain is so beautiful uh, in the morning when you're in bed and you're under a nice warm fuzzy comforter and you don't want to get out of bed. But we get out of there because we can't stand to miss church. We find ourselves drawn to worship music. We find our uh, relationships, our associations begin to change. The people that we used to think were freaks, we now call our friends. And they even feel like our family. We're a freak too. Our thoughts change. Our speech changes. Our behavior changes. Our friends and family say, what is up with you? Likewise, our experience with the Holy Spirit it begins like just a, a little gurgle inside of us at first. And then our experience of him, it keeps growing and growing until he's become a gushing river that encompasses all of our life and sweeps us away. In the Gospel of John, Jesus told us that we ought to e expect a rising river experience. In John 4, he said that our salvation starts out like a, a little well springing up inside of us. But by John 7, he says that the Holy Spirit is a gushing river flowing out of us. You know, David had that kind of rising river experience. He, he wrote, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul is thirsty for you. And then a few verses later, he writes this, deep calls unto deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and your breakers have washed over me. And beloved, here is the word of the Lord for Harvest Time Church in 2016. Look at this. Look at this supernaturally rising river and expect to experience the same in 2016. Expect for the trickle of salvation to grow into a rushing torrent inside of you. Expect to 
be taken by the hand and to be led into deeper and deeper and faster moving spiritual waters. Expect to be guided more and more by the Holy Spirit and less and less by your own earthly desires and decision making skills. You see, here's the thing about God's river. The further you travel in it, the less you are in control and the more you just surrender yourself to God's current. You know, in ankle deep water, it's pretty easy to travel in any direction you want, even if it's against the current. In knee deep water, it takes a little bit more work to fight the current. In waist deep water, water it's getting very hard to resist the current but when you're in over your head it's impossible to fight that current anymore you have no choice but to surrender to the current Ezekiel said the river grew so big over my head that I couldn't cross it anymore I couldn't go at cross purposes with the current I just gave up and I went with it in 2016, God wants to take you by the hand and he wants to lead you from the place of stubborn independence to the place of sweet surrender to him. He wants to take you by the hand and he wants to lead you to that place where you're moved by the current of his spirit in his direction and in his timing. Beloved, I feel a word in my spirit for someone in this place today. The Lord says to you, my direction and my timing. My direction and my timing. Not your direction and your timing, but my direction. And my, I feel like there is someone who you're, you're just even a little frustrated with God. You're a little put out with God because something hasn't happened in the timing that you wanted or you anticipated. And the Holy Spirit says, just be still and know that I am God. It's my direction in my timing. God wants your feet in his river so that every footstep you take in 2016 will be sure and will be steady and will be in his direction, in his timing. You know what? God's given us precious. You know, we're, we're the heirs to precious promises. God has promised you that your foot will not slip, that he's not going to let you put down your foot in a wrong place. He's not going to let you make a wrong decision. He's not going to let you accept the wrong offer. Or take the wrong deal. He's not going to let you move in the wrong direction. And he wants his river flowing over your feet so that he can guide every one of your footsteps so that they're sure and they're steady and they're in his direction, in his time. And God wants your knees in his river so that you will only kneel down to Jesus Christ in 2016 and you won't kneel down to any other earthly idol. God wants your waist in his river so that all your, you know, your core of your being, it's the center of all your bodily appetites. And God wants your waist in his river so that your bodily appetites are immersed in his pure and wholesome current and subjected entirely to his influence. God wants your head in his river so that your carnal mind might be renewed and the mind of Christ might dwell in you richly. Look at this harvest time. Look at this supernaturally rising river and expect to experience the same in 2016. Expect to experience God's presence in greater and greater intensity until you are completely overwhelmed by him. You've experienced a little gurgle from the Holy Spirit so far, but God wants to take you by the hand and he wants to lead you into the gushing river. Expect to hear the roar of his waterfalls in your spirit. Expect his waves and his breakers to sweep over you. That's good preaching right there. I love you, but I'm preaching just a little better than you're listening right now. I feel this word from the Holy Spirit. Because the river comes from God, it brings to us everything that God is. The river brings God's love to us that makes us whole. It brings God's peace to us that makes us satisfied and secured. But here's the word that I feel especially in my spirit for 2016. The river brings God's joy to us. 
Psalm 46 says, God's river makes God's people glad. Isaiah says, with joy, we will draw water from the wells of salvation. Beloved, can I tell you, there is just not enough joy to go around these days. There's not enough joy in our hearts. There's not enough joy in our homes. There's not enough joy in our worship. The Bible says shouts of joy and victory will ring out in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Seriously, I know the worship guys aren't going to appreciate it, but it's time to get rid of these melancholy songs of desperation, and it's time for some songs of victorious celebration and some, time, some songs of majestic elevation of God. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. And we don't have to beg God for water. God's river is already here because he promised it's so. And we couldn't stop it from rising if we tried. And here's what I believe is going to happen in 2016. Here's what I believe is going to happen in the American church at large. Here's what I believe is going to happen at Harvest Time Church. I believe that God's river is going to rise and joy is going to rise with it. I believe joy is going to wash over our heads and it's going to remove pessimism. It's going to remove anxiety, depression, paranoia from our thinking. It's going to wash over our mouths. It's going to remove negative confession and and cursing from our mouth. I believe that joy is going to wash over our chests and it's going to remove sorrow and grief from our heart. I know what it is to grieve. I grieved at the start and at the end of 2015, but God has promised in his word, I will take away your spirit of heaviness and I'll put in place a garment of joyful praise. I believe God wants to wash over our chests and he wants to wash regret out of our hearts and bitterness out of our hearts. Listen to me, beloved. It's a new year. It's time to stop looking back on your past and kicking yourself over and over again for all the things that went wrong and the dumb choices you made and, and everything that was done to you. God wants to wash over your chest and he wants to wash that out of your heart and he wants to put joy there instead. I believe joy is going to wash over our knees and put a little bounce back in our step in 2016. I believe joy is going to wash over our feet and put a little dance to the Lord in our feet. Jesus said that the river is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come on, I, I want a little flag waving, a little feet dancing, a little tongue talking, hand clapping joy in the church of God. How do I know the river's going to rise? Because God has said so in his word. Because Jesus said so. And the Holy Spirit told me to remind you that it's so. See, the supernatural rise of God's river it's also a picture of the rise of God's presence in his last day's church. Beloved, let me tell you something about the church in these last days. We are not gurgle of God people. We are gushing river of God people. You know, the church started out as nothing more than a little gurgle in Jerusalem. In the vast expanse of the Roman Empire, who took note of a bleeding Jew on a cross on a hill outside of Jerusalem? Who noticed the gurgle of blood and water? It's the same word, the gurgle of blood and water that ran out of his side when they pierced him. Only the people of Jerusalem knew when Jesus died and only a handful of them cared. Who took note of a small crowd in an upper room and the sound of a tornadic wind and the babble of tongues? Who noticed when the first followers of the Nazarene started to fan out across Palestine because persecution pushed them out of Jerusalem? 
The church started out in the world as nothing more than a little trickle from God's temple, but oh, how it's grown in the world, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. And here's the thing about Ezekiel's vision of the last days. In these last days, the church is not a gurgle, but a gushing river full of the activity and life and authority and power of the Holy Spirit. The last days church is over your head deep in the presence of our great God. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. The last days church has an unstoppable, powerful current of the life of God running through it. The last days church has unquenchable love. The last days church has unwavering faith. The last days church has irreparable pressable joy. The last day's church has unshakable peace. The last day's church has unrelenting resolve to follow Jesus. The last day's church will experience a rising tide of God's glory and absolutely nothing on earth can stop it because it is God's doing. It is the supernatural work of God. Look at this. Worship team, come help me finish if you would. And here's something to hold on to at the start of this new year. Beloved, listen, receive this in your spirit. Take hold of it and, and lock it up like a precious treasure in your heart. Here's a word to hold on to for 2016. We don't know what is going to happen in the world this year. Psalm 46 says that nature might shake and roar. The nations might shake and roar. We don't know what ISIS is going to do. We don't know what Iran is going to do. We don't know what Syria is going to do. We don't know what China is going to do. We don't know if Kim Jong-un has done what he said he did. We don't know what Washington is going to do. We don't know what Wall Street is going to do. We don't know what the Fed is going to do. We don't know what Donald Trump will say next, and neither does he. <laughs> we don't know what the weather is going to do. Don't know what this world is going to do, but we do know what our great God is going to do. God is going to cause the river of his glorious presence to supernaturally rise in his church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Difficult days they might come on the earth, yet God's river is going to rise. Sifting might come to the church, yet God's river is going to rise. The love of many might grow cold, yet God's river is going to rise. Persecution might come to our shores, yet the river is going to rise. America may forget her Christian heritage, yet God's river is going to rise. Listen to me, I refuse to believe that America is in the post Christian era, I choose to believe that it is just in the pre-revival era. You know what? While we're, while we're fasting and praying, let's fast and pray for this group called Millennials. The Millennials are the most unchurched group in the history of our country. They're skeptical. They've been failed by every kind of leader. Political leaders have failed them. The authorities have failed them. Religious leaders have failed them. They have seen one after the other fall and be hypocritical and they're pessimistic and they don't think that anybody can really walk a straight line. Let's pray for that generation because listen, God said he's going to cause a rising current of his spirit to, to well up and no one is going to be able to stop it. It's true. The Bible says that in these last days, demonically ferocious times will come. The onset of those times is already here. But the Bible also says that God has the last word on the last days. And God has said in these last days, I will Pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and on your daughters, on the millennials. 
the Bible says that in the last days, the whole earth will be full of the glory of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's why we're building a bigger sanctuary out there right now. Because our eyes are not fixed on our thinking culture. But our eyes are fixed on our faithful God. Who has promised us a rising river in these last days. So let the river rise. Let it rise in our hearts. Let it rise in our spirits. Let it rise in our souls. Let it rise in our homes. Let it rise in Harvest Time Church. Let it rise in our worship. Ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, over our head deep. Let God's waterfall roar and let his waves and his breakers sweep over us. Let his river overwhelm us. Let his river of his 